So today's lecture is going to continue on the lecture that you saw on Tuesday, which was introducing you to causal inference. So the causal inference setting, which we, uh, which we're studying in this course, is a really simplistic one from a causal graphs perspective. There are three sets of variables of interest. Uh, everything you know about an individual or patient, which we're calling X uh, over here, um, an intervention uh, or action, uh, which for today's lecture, we're going to suppose that it's either zero or one, so a binary intervention, you either take it or don't, um, and an outcome Y. And what makes this problem of understanding the impact of the intervention on the outcome challenging is that we have to make that inference from observational data where we don't have the ability, uh, at least not in medicine, we typically don't have the ability to make uh, interventions, actively interventions. And the goal of what we will be discussing in this course is about how to take data that was collected from the practice of medicine where actions or interventions were taken and then use that to infer the something about the causal effect. And obviously there are also randomized controlled trials where one intentionally does randomize, um, but, uh, but the focus of today's lecture is going to be using observational data, already collected data to try to make these conclusions. So we introduced the language of potential outcomes on Tuesday. Uh, potential outcomes is the mathematical framework for trying to answer these questions. Then with that definition of potential outcomes, we can define the conditional average treatment effect, which is the difference between Y1 and Y0 for the individual XI. Um, so you'll notice here that I have patient, so I'm treating the potential outcome as a random variable in case there might be some stochasticity. So sometimes maybe if you were to give someone a treatment, it works, and sometimes it doesn't. So that's what the expectation is accounting for. Any questions before I move on? So with respect to um, this definition of conditional average treatment effect, then you could ask, well, what would happen in aggregate for the population? Uh, and you can compute that by taking the average of the conditional average treatment effect uh, over all of the individuals. So that's just this expectation with respect to now P of X. Now, critically, this distribution, P of X, you should think about as the distribution of everyone that exists um, in, your, in, in your data. So some of those individuals might have received treatment one in the past, some of them might have received treatment zero. But when we ask this question about the average treatment effect, we're asking for both of those populations, what would have been the effect, what would have been the difference of, of outcomes had they received treatment one minus had they received Zero. Now, uh, I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to start thinking a little bit bigger picture about how causal inference uh, play uh, it, it can be important in a variety of societal questions. Um, and, uh, and so I'd like to now uh, spend just a couple of minutes thinking with you about what some causal questions might be that we need urgently need to answer about the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you try to think through this, these questions, I want you to have this causal graph in mind, right? So there is the, the general population, there is some action that you want to perform, and, and, the, and the whole notion of, of uh, causal inference is assessing the effect of the action on some outcome of interest. So in trying to give the answer to my, or an, various answers to my questions of what are some causal inference questions of relevance to the current uh, pandemic, I want you to try to frame your answers in terms of these X, T's, and Y's. Um, it's also obviously very hard to answer using the types of techniques that we will be discussing in this course, and, and partly because the techniques that I'm focusing on are very much data-driven techniques. That said, the general framework that, I, that I've introduced on Tuesday for covariate adjustment um, of come up with a model and use that model to make a prediction um, and, the, and the assumptions that underlie that in terms of, well, where is that model coming from if you're fitting the parameters from data, having to ha have common support in order to be able to um, have any trust in the down, uh, downstream conclusions. Those underlying assumptions and the general premises will still hold, but here, obviously, when it comes to something like social distancing, there are complicated um, uh, network effects. And so, whereas 
up until now, we've been making the assumption of what was called sattva. Um, it was an um, assumption that I, uh, I, I probably didn't even talk about in Tuesday's lecture. Um, but intuitively, what's, what the sattva assumption says is that each of your training examples are independent of each other. And that might make sense when you think about, you know, give a patient a medication or not, but it certainly doesn't make sense when you think about social distancing type measures where if some people social distance, but other people don't, it has obviously a very different impact on, on society. So one needs a different class of, of models to try to think about that, which have to relax that sattva assumption. So those were all really good answers to my, uh, to my question. Um, and in some sense, now, it, so, so there's the epidemiological type questions that we last spoke about, but the first few set of questions about really how does one treat patients with, um, who have COVID uh, are the types of questions that only now we can really start to answer. Now, unfortunately, because we're starting to get a lot of data in the United States and internationally. Um, and so for, for example, my own personal research group, we're starting to really scale up our research on these types of questions. Now, um, one very simplified example that I wanted to give of how a causal inference lens could be useful here is by trying to understand case fatality rates. So for example, in Italy, it was reported that 4.3% uh, of individuals who, um, who, who had this condition um, passed away, whereas in China, it was reported that 2.3% of individuals who had this condition uh, passed away. Now, you might ask, based on just those two numbers, is something different about China, for example, might it be that um, the, way th uh, the way that uh, COVID is being managed in China is, is better than in Italy? You might also wonder if, um, if the strain of the disease might be different um, between uh, China and Italy. So perhaps there were some um, mutations uh, since, uh, since, it, since it left Wuhan. Um, but if you dig a little bit deeper, uh, you see that if you plot case fatality rates by age group, um, you get this plot that I'm showing over here, and you see that if you compare Italy, which is the orange, to China, which is blue, now stratified by age range, you see that for every single age range, the percentage of, um, of, 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 of death, um, deaths is lower in Italy than in China which would seem to be a contradiction with what we saw uh, with the aggregate numbers where we see that uh, the, the case fatality rate in Italy is higher than in China. And so the reason why this can happen has to do with, um, with the fact that the populations are very different. Um, and by the way, this paradox goes by the name of Simpson's paradox. So if you dig a bit deeper, you see then that uh, if you're to look at, well, what is the distribution of individuals in China and Italy that have, uh, um, that have been reported to have uh, COVID, you see that in Italy, it's much more highly weighted towards these older um, uh, aged ages. And uh, if you then combine that with the total number of cases, you get, uh, you get to these discrepancies. Um, so it, it now fully explains the, these two numbers in the, in the plot that you see. Now, if we were to try to think about this a bit more formally, we would try to formalize it in terms of following causal graph. And so here um, we have the same notions of X, T, and Y, where X is uh, the age of an individual who has been diagnosed with, uh, with COVID. T is now country. So we're gonna think about the uh, the intervention here as sort of transporting ourselves from China to Italy. So thinking about changing the environment altogether and why is the outcome on an individual level basis. And so the, the formal question that one might want to ask is about the causal impact of changing the country on the outcome why. Now for this particular causal question, this causal graph that I'm drawing here is the wrong one. And in fact, the right causal graph probably has an edge that goes from T to X. In particular, the distribution of individuals in the country is obviously a function of the country, not the other way around. Um, 
but despite the fact that there is that one that difference in directionality all of the techniques that we've been teaching you in this course are still applicable for trying to ask um, a causal question about the impact of intervening on a, on, on a country um, and that's really because the um, uh, the, in some sense, these two distributions at, at an observational level are equivalent. Um, and if you want to dig a little bit deeper into this example, and, and I, I, guess I want to stress that this is just for educational purposes, um, uh, I, I don't read anything into these numbers, uh, I, I would go to this collab notebook uh, after the course. So, um, so all of this was just a little bit of setup to, to help frame where causal inference shows up in uh, and some things that we've been thinking and, and, and really very worried and stressed about ourselves personally recently. Um, and I wanna now shift gears to starting to get back to the course material. And, and in particular, I wanna to start today's um, more theoretical parts of the lecture is by returning to covariate adjustment, which we ended on on Tuesday. In covariate adjustment, one um, will use a machine learning approach uh, to learn some model, which I'll call F. So some, you can imagine a black box machine learning algorithm, which takes as input both X and T. So X are your covariates of the individual that are going to receive the, the treatment, and T is that treatment decision, which for today's lecture, you can just assume is binary zero or one, and uses those together now to predict the outcome Y. Now, what we showed in Tuesday that is, was that under ignorability, where ignorability, remember, was the assumption of no hidden confounding, then the conditional average treatment effect um, could be defined uh, as just the difference, uh, could, be could be computed as the expectation of Y1 now conditioned on T equals one. So this is the piece that I've added in here and minus the, the expectation of Y0 now conditioned on T equals zero. And it's that conditioning which is really important because that's what enables you to es estimate Y1 from data where treatment one was observed, whereas you never get to observe Y1 in data when treatment zero was, was, was performed. So we have this formula and after fitting that model F, one could then use it to try to estimate Kate by just taking that learned function, plugging in the, the, the number one for the treatment variable uh, in order to get your estimate of this expectation and then plugging in the number zero for the treatment variable when you want to get your estimate of this distribution of this expectation and taking the difference between those then gives you your estimate of the conditional average treatment effect. So, um, so that's the approach and what we didn't talk about so much was the modeling choices of what should your function class be. So this is going to turn out to be really important and really the punchline of the next several slides is going to be a major difference in philosophy between machine learning and statistics and between prediction and causal inference. So let's now consider the following simple model where I'm going to assume that the ground truth in the real world has that the potential outcome y t of x, where t again is the, is the treatment, is equal to um, some simple linear model involving the covariates x and the treatment t, the treatment t. So in this very simple setting, I'm going to assume that we just have a single uh, feature or covariate for the individual, which is their age. And I'm going to assume that this model um, doesn't have any terms with an interaction between X and T. So it, it's fully linear in X and T. So this is an assumption about the true potential outcomes. And what we'll do over the next couple of slides is think about what would happen if you now modeled Y of T, so modeling it with some function F, where F was, let's say, a linear function versus a nonlinear function if F took this form or a different form. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to assume that the noise here, epsilon t, can be arbitrary, but that it has zero mean. So let's get started by trying to estimate what the true Kate is, or conditional average treatment effect, for this, uh, for this potential outcome model. 
Well, just by definition, the case is the expectation of y1 minus y0. We're going to take this formula and we're going to plug it in for, um, for the first term using t equals one. And that's why you get this term over here with a gamma. And the gamma is because again, t is equal to one. We're also gonna take this and we're going to plug it in for now this term over here where t is equal to zero. And when t is equal to zero, then the gamma term just disappears. And so what you just get beta x uh, plus epsilon zero. All right, so all I've done so far is plug in the um, y1 and y0 according to the assumed form. But notice now that there's some terms that cancel out. In particular, the beta x term over here cancels out with the beta x term over here. And because epsilon one has a zero mean and epsilon zero also has a zero mean, the only thing left is that gamma term and expectation of a constant is obviously that constant. And so what we conclude from this is that the Kate value is gamma. Now, the average treatment effect, which is the average of Kate over all individuals X, will then also be gamma, obviously. Okay, so we've done something pretty interesting here. We started from the assumption that the true potential outcome model is linear. And what we concluded is that the average treatment effect is precisely the coefficient of the treatment variable in this linear model. So what that, what that means is that if what you're interested in is causal inference, and suppose that we were lucky enough to know that the true model were linear, and so we attempted to fit some function f, which had precisely the same form, we get some beta hats and some gamma hats out from the learning algorithm, all we need to do is look at that gamma hat in order to conclude something about the average treatment effect. No need to do this complicated thing of plugging in um, to estimate Kate. Um, and again, that, the reason it's such a trivial conclusion is because of our assumption of linearity. Now, what that also means is that if you have errors in learning, in particular, suppose, for example, that you are estimating your gamma hat wrongly, then that means you're also going to be getting wrong your estimates of your conditional, uh, of your conditional and average treatment effects. Uh, there's a question here, which I was lucky enough to see, that says, what does gamma represent in terms of the medication? Um, thank you for that question. So gamma is, um, well, literally speaking, gamma tells you the conditional average treatment effect, meaning um, if you were to give the treatment versus not giving the treatment, how that affects the outcome. Think about the outcome of interest being the patient's blood pressure, there being a confounding, potential confounding factor of the patient's age, and T being um, one of two different blood pressure measurements. If gamma is um, positive, then it means that treatment one is more effective, treatment one increases the patient's blood pressure relative to treatment zero. And if gamma is negative, it means that, it, that treatment one decreases the patient's blood pressure relative to treatment zero. So if one, so in, in machine learning, oh, uh, sorry, there's another chat. Uh, thank you, good. Um, so in machine learning, I typically tell my students, don't attempt to interpret your coefficients, or at least don't interpret them too much. Don't put too much um, weight into them. And that's because when you're learning very high dimensional models, there could be a lot of redundancy between your features. But when you talk to statisticians, often they pay really close attention to their coefficients. And they try to interpret those coefficients often with the causal lens. And when I first got started in this field, I couldn't understand why are they paying attention to those coefficients so much? Why are they coming up with these causal hypotheses based on which coefficients are positive, which are the negative? And this is the answer. It really comes down to an, uh, in turn, an interpretation of the prediction problem in terms of the feature of relevance being a treatment, it, that treatment being linear with respect to the potential outcome, and then looking at the coefficient of the treatment as telling you something about the average treatment effect of that intervention or treatment. 
Moreover, that also tells us why it's often very important to look at confidence intervals. So, um, so one might want to know, okay, we have some small data set, we get some estimate of, uh, of, uh, of gamma hat, but what if you had a different data set? So what happens if you had a new sample of, an, of this 100 data points? How would your estimated gamma hat vary? And so you might be interested, for example, in confidence intervals, like a 95% confidence interval that says that gamma hat is between, let's say, um, um, is let's say between, you know, uh, one and let's say maybe uh, 0.5 with probability uh, 0.95. That would be an example of a, uh, a confidence interval around gamma hat. Um, and such a confidence interval then gives you confidence a confidence interval around the coefficients, then gives you confidence intervals around the average treatment effect via this analysis. So the second observation is what happens if the true model isn't linear, but we had, hadn't realized that as a modeler, and we had just assumed that, well, you know, a linear model is probably good enough, and maybe even a linear model gets pretty good prediction performance. Well, let's look at sort of the extreme example of this. Let's now assume that the, tr the true data generating process, instead of being just beta x plus gamma t, we're going to add in now a new term, um, delta times x squared. Now, this is sort of the, this is the most naive extension of the original linear model that you could imagine, because I'm not even adding any interaction terms like, you know, 10 times uh, xt. So no interaction terms involving treatment and covariate. Treatment is still, the, the potential outcome is still linear in treatment. We're just adding a single nonlinear term involving one of the uh, features. Now, if you compute the average treatment effect via the same analysis we did before, you'll again find the average treatment effect is gamma. Let's suppose now that we hadn't known that there was that delta x squared term in there, and we hypothesized that the potential outcome um, was given to you by this linear model involving x and t. And I'm going to use um, y hat to denote that that's going to be the function family that we're going to be fitting. So we now fit that beta hat and gamma hat. And if you had infinite data drawn from this true generating process, which is again unknown, what one can show is that the gamma hat that you would estimate using any reasonable estimator like a least squares estimator is actually equal to gamma, the true ATE value, plus delta times this term. And notice that this term does not depend on beta or uh, gamma. What this means is, depending on delta, your gamma hat could be made arbitrarily large or arbitrarily small. So for example, if delta is very large, gamma hat might become positive when gamma might have been negative. And so your conclusions about the average treatment effect could be completely wrong. And this should scare you, right? This is the thing which makes using covariate adjustment so dangerous, which is that if you're making the wrong assumptions about the true potential outcomes, you could get very, very wrong conclusions. So uh, because of that, one typically wants to live in a world where you don't have to make many assumptions about the form so that you could try to fit the data as well as possible. So here you see that there's this nonlinear term. Well, obviously if you had used some uh, nonlinear modeling algorithm like a neural network or maybe a random forest, then it would have the potential to fit that nonlinear function and then maybe wouldn't get caught in this, in this same trap. And there are a variety of machine learning algorithms that have been applied to causal inference, um, everything from random forests and um, Bayesian uh, additive regression trees to algorithms like Gaussian processes and deep neural networks. I'll just briefly highlight the last two. So Gaussian processes are very often used to model continuous valued potential outcomes. And there are a couple of ways in which they can be done. So for example, um, one class of models might treat uh, Y1 and Y0 as two separate Gaussian processes uh, and fit those two um, to the data. A different approach shown on the right here would be to treat, uh, would be to treat y, uh, y as, um, treat x and t as, where, treat t as an additional covariate. So now you have 
uh, X and T as your features and fit a Gaussian process uh, for that joint model. Uh, when it comes to neural networks, uh, neural networks had, had been used in causal inference going back about 20, 30 years, um, but, uh, but really started catching on uh, a few years ago um, with a, a paper that I wrote in my, in my group as being one of the earliest papers from this recent generation of, of using neural networks for causal inference. And one of the things that we found to work very effectively uh, is to use a joint model for predicting the causal effect. So um, we're going to be learning a model that takes as an, an F that takes as an input um, X and T and has to predict Y. And the advantage of that is that it's going to allow us to share parameters across your T equals one and T equals zero samples. But rather than feeding in X and T in your first layer of your neural network, we're only going to feed in X in the, first, in, 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 the, in the initial layer of the neural network. And we're going to learn a shared representation, which is going to be used for both predicting T equals zero and T equals one. And then for predicting T zero, for, for predicting when T is equal to zero, we use um, a different head from predicting T equals one. So, um, F0 is a function that concatenates this, the, these shared layers with several new layers used to predict uh, for, for when t is equal to zero and sim analogously for one. And we found that that, uh, that architecture works substantially better than the naive architectures when doing causal inference on several different benchmark data sets. Now, the last thing I want to talk about when it, uh, uh, for covariate adjustment um, before I move on to a new set of techniques um, is a method called matching that is intuitively very pleasing. Um, it's, it's a very, see, would seem to be a really natural approach to do causal inference. And at first glance may look like it has nothing to do with covariate adjustment technique. What I'll do now is I'm going to first introduce you to the matching technique, and then I will show you that it actually is precisely identical to covariate adjustment um, with a particular assumption of what the functional family for F is. So not Gaussian processes, not deep neural networks, but it'll be something else. So before I get into that, what is matching as a technique for causal inference? Well, the key idea of matching is to use each individual's twin to try to get some intuition about what their potential outcome might have been. So um, I created these slides a few years ago. Uh, when President Obama was in office. And you might imagine, um, you know, this is the, the actual uh, President Obama who did go to law school. And you might imagine who might have been that other president. You know, what would President Obama have been like had he not gone to law school, but um, let's say gone to business school? And so you can now imagine trying to find in your data set someone else who looks just like uh, Barack Obama, but who instead of going to uh, law school went to business school. And then you would then ask the following question. For example, um, would this individual have gone to become a president had he gone to law school versus had he gone to business school? If you find someone else who's just like Barack Obama who went to business school, look to see, did that person become president eventually? That would in some instance give you that counterfactual. Obviously this is a contrived example because uh, you would never get the sample size to see that. So that's the general idea. Um, and, and now I'll show it to you in a picture. So here now we have two covariates uh, or features, a patient's age and their Charlson comorbidity index. Um, this is some measure of how many, uh, what types of conditions or comorbidities the patient might have. Like do they have diabetes? Do they have hypertension and so on? And notably, what I'm, what I'm not showing you here is the outcome Y. All I'm showing you are the original data points and what treatment did they receive. So blue are the individuals who received the control treatment, or T was zero, and red are the individuals who received treatment one. So you can imagine trying to find nearest neighbors. For example, the nearest neighbor to this data point over here is this blue point over here. And so you wanted, if you wanted to know, okay, well, what we observe some Y1 
for this individual. We observe some y0 for this individual. And if you wanted to know, well, what would have happened to this individual if they had received treatment zero instead of treatment one, well, you could just look at what happened to this blue point and say, okay, that's what would have happened to this red point because they're very close to each other. Any questions about what matching would do before I define it formally? I'll, I'll uh, yep, okay, good, one question. What happens if the nearest neighbor is extremely far away? Okay, that's a great question. So you can imagine that you have one red data point over here and no blue data point is nearby. The matching approach wouldn't work very well. So this data point, the nearest neighbor is this blue point over here, which uh, intuitively is very far from this red point. And so, um, if we were to estimate this red point's counterfactual using that blue point, we're likely to get a very bad estimate. And in fact, that is going to be one of the challenges of matching based approaches. It's going to work really well in a high dimensional setting where, um, where you can imagine, or sorry, in a large sample, it's going to work very well in a large sample setting where you could hope that you're likely to observe a counterfactual for every individual. And it won't work well if you have very limited data. And of course, all of this is going to be subject to the assumption of common support. So one question is about how does that translate into high dimensions? The short answer, not very well. We'll get back to that in a moment. Can a single data point appear in multiple matchings? Um, yes. Uh, and I will, uh, I'll, I'll define in just a moment uh, how and why. It won't be a strict matching. Um, are we trying to find a counterfactual for each treated observation for, or one for each control observation? I'll answer that in just a second. Um, and finally, is it common for medical data sets to find such matching pairs? I'm going to reinterpret that question as saying, um, is this technique used often in medicine? And the answer is yes, it's used all the time in clinical research, uh, despite the fact that um, biostatisticians for quite a few years now have been trying to argue that folks should not use this technique uh, for reasons that you'll see shortly. Um, so it's widely used, it's very intuitive, which is why I'm teaching it. Um, and it's going to fit into a very general framework as you'll see in just a moment, which will give you the natural solution for the problems that I'm going to ra raise. So moving on and then I'll return to any remaining questions. So here I'll define uh, one of what we, uh, one way of, of, of doing counterfactual inference using matching. And it's going to start, of course, by assuming that we have some distance metric D between individuals. Then we're going to say for each individual I, let's let J of I be the other individual J, obviously different from I, who is closest to I, but critically closest, but has a different treatment. So where ti is different from tj okay and again i'm assuming binary so so uh, tj is either zero or one with that definition then we're going to define that the estimate we're going to define our estimate of the conditional average treatment effect for an individual is whatever their actual observed outcome was um, this I'm going to give for an individual that actually received treatment one. So it's Y1, and the reason it's YI um, minus the imputed counterfactual corresponding to T is equal to zero. And the way we get that computed counterfactual is by trying to find that nearest neighbor who received treatment zero instead of treatment one and looking at their Y. Analogously, if TI is equal to zero, then we're going to use the observed yi now over here instead of over there because it corresponds to y0. And where we need to impute y1, um, capital Y1, the potential outcome Y1, we're going to use the observed outcome from the nearest neighbor of indiv individual i who received treatment one instead of zero. All right, so this mathematically is what I mean by our matching based estimator. And this also should answer the question, one of the questions which was raised, which is, does it, do you really need to have a matching 
or could a data point be used, uh, could a data point be matched to multiple other data points? And indeed here you see that answer that last question is yes, because you could have a setting where, for example, there are um, two red points here, and I can't draw blue, but I'll just use a square for what I would have drawn as blue. Um, and then everything else very far away. And for both of these red points, this blue point is the, uh, is, is the closest neighbor. So both of, both of the counterfactual estimates um, for these two points would be using the same blue point. So that's the answer to that question. Now, uh, I'm just going to rewrite this in a little bit more convenient form. So I'll take this formula shown over here, and you can rewrite that as yi minus yji, but you have to just flip the sign depending on whether ti is equal to one or zero. And so that's what this term is going to do. Um, if ti is equal to one, then this evaluates to uh, one. If ti is equal to zero, this evaluates to minus one, so it flips the sign. So now that we have the definition of Kate, we can get the we can now easily estimate the average treatment effect by just averaging these kates over all of the individuals in your data set. Um, so this is now the definition of uh, of how to do one nearest neighbor matching. Any questions? So one question is: Do we ever use the metric D to weight how much we would quote unquote trust the matching? Um, uh, that's a good question. So uh, what, um, what, what Hannah is asking is, um, could it, you know, what happens if you have, for example, very many nearest neighbors or analogously, what happens if you have some nearest neighbors that are really close, some that are really far, you know, might imagine trying to weight uh, your nearest neighbors by the distance from the data point. Um, and and you, you can imagine even doing that uh, you can even imagine coming up with an estimator which might discount certain data points if they don't have nearest neighbors near them at all um, by the corresponding weighting factor. Yes, that's a good idea. Yes, you can come up with a consistent estimator of the average treatment effect you, through such an idea. Um, there are probably a few hundred papers written about it and that's all I have to say about it. Um, so there's lots of variants of this um, and they all end up having the same theoretical justification that I'm about to give in the next slide. So um, one of the advantages of, of, of matching is that you get some interpretability. So if I was to ask you, well, what's the reason why you tell me that this treatment is gonna work for John? Well, someone could respond, well, I used this technique and I found that the nearest neighbor to John was this, um, was Anna uh, and this is what, and Anna took the, this other treatment from John, and this is what happened for Anna. And that's why I conjecture that for John, the difference between Y1 and Y0 is as follows. And so then that can be criticized. So for example, a, cl a clinician who has some domain expert can look at Anna, look at John, and say, oh, wait a second, these two individuals are really different from one another. You know, let's say the treatment, for example, had to do with um, something which was gender specific, uh, then taking two individuals that are comparing two individuals which are of different genders are obviously not going to be comparable to one another. And so that would, um, then the domain expert would be, able to, would be able to reject that conclusion and say, no, -uh, I don't trust any of the statistics, go back to the drawing board. And so that type of interpretability, interpretability is, is, is very uh, attractive. Um, the second aspect of this, which is very attractive, is that it's a non-parametric method. Non-parametric in the same way in that neural networks or random forests are non-parametric. So um, this does not rely on any strong assumption about the parametric form of the potential outcomes. On the other hand, this approach is very reliant on the underlying metric. If your distance function is a poor distance function, then it's going to give uh, poor results. And moreover, um, it could be very much misled by features that don't affect uh, the outcome, uh, which is not necessarily a property that we want. Now, here's that final slide that makes the connection. Matching is equivalent to covariate adjustment. It's exactly the same. It's an, it's an instantiation of covariate adjustment with a particular functional family for f. So rather than assuming that your function f, that black box, is a linear function or a neural network or random forest or or a uh, Bayesian additive regression tree, we're going to assume that that function takes the form of a nearest neighbor classifier. In particular, 
we'll say that y hat of one, that the function for predicting the potential outcome y hat one is given to you by finding the nearest neighbor of, um, of the data point x. Um, according to the uh, data set of individuals that receive treatment one, and same thing for y hat zero. And so um, that then allows us to actually prove some properties of, uh, of, of matching. Um, so for example, if you remember from, uh, I think I, I mentioned in, in Tuesday's lecture that this covariate adjustment approach under the assumptions of overlap and under the assumptions of um, uh, no hidden confounding and that you can that your function family for potential outcome is sufficiently rich that you can actually fit the uh, underlying model then you're going to get correct estimates of your um, conditional average treatment effect now um, one can show that uh, a one nearest, a, a nearest neighbor algorithm is not in generally a consistent algorithm. And what that means is that if you have um, a small number of samples, you're going to be getting biased estimate. Your, your function f might in general be a biased estimate. Now, we can conclude from that that if we were to use one nearest neighbor matching for, for inferring average treatment effect, that in general it could give us a biased estimate of the average treatment effect. However, in the limit of infinite data, um, uh, one nearest neighbor algorithms are guaranteed to be able to fit um, the underlying function family. That is to say that bias goes to zero in the, in the limit of a large amount of data. And thus we can immediately draw from that literature uh, in causal inference, sorry, from that literature in machine learning uh, to obtain theoretical results for matching uh, for causal inference. And so that's, that's all I want to say about matching and its connection to, uh, to query adjustment. Um, and really the punchline is uh, think, think about matching just as another type of query adjustment, one which uses a nearest neighbor function family um, and thus should be compared to other approaches um, to, uh, to covariate adjustment, such as, for example, using machine learning algorithms that are designed to be interpretable. So um, the, the last part of this lecture is going to be introducing a, a, a second approach for inferring conditional average, for inferring average treatment effect um, that is known as the propensity score method. And this is going to be a real shift. It's going to be a different estimator from the covariate adjustment. So, um, so as I mentioned, it's going to be used for estimating average treatment effect. In problem set four, you're going to see how you can use the same sorts of techniques I'll tell you about now for also estimating conditional average treatment effect, um, but that won't be obvious just from today's lecture. So the key intuition for propensity, the propensity score method is to think back to what would have happened if you had a randomized control trial. In a randomized control trial, again, um, you get some, you get choice over what, in, what treatment to give at each individual. So you might imagine flipping a coin, if it's heads, giving them treatment one, if it's tails, giving them treatment zero. So given data from a randomized controlled trial, then there's a really simple estimator shown here for the average treatment effect. You just sum up the uh, values of Y for the individuals that receive treatment one divided by N1, which is the number of individuals that receive treatment one. So this is the average outcome for all people who got treatment one. And you just subtract from that the average outcome for all individuals who receive treatment zero. And that can be easily shown to be an unbiased estimator of the average treatment effect had your data come from a randomized control trial. So the key idea of a propensity score method is to turn an observational study into something that looks like a randomized control trial via reweighting of the data points. So here's the picture I want you to have in mind. Um, again, here I am not showing you outcomes. I'm just showing you the features X, that's what the data points are, and the treatments that were given to them, um, the, X, the T's, and the T's in this case are being denoted by the color of the dots. So red is T equals one, blue is T equals zero. And my apologies in advance for anyone who's colorblind. So the key challenge when working with an observational study 
is that there might be a bias in terms of who receives treatment zero versus who receives treatment one. If this was a randomized control tile, then you would expect to see the reds and the blues all intermixed equally with one another. But as you can see here in this data set, there are very many more people who received, who, very more young people who received treatment zero than received treatment one. Said differently, if you look at the distribution over X conditioned on T equals zero in the data, it's different from the, condition, the distribution over X conditioned on the people who received treatment one. So what the propensity score method is going to do is going to recognize that there is a difference between these two distributions and it's going to reweight data points so that an aggregate, it looks like in any one region. So for example, if you imagine looking at this region, that there's roughly the same number of red and blue data points um, where, you know, if you think about blowing up this red data point here, I made it very big. You can think about it being many, many red data points uh, of the corresponding weight. If we look over here, see again, so, so roughly same number of red and blue, same amount of red and blue mass as well. So if we can find some way to increase or decrease the weight associated with each data point such that now it looks like the two uh, distributions, those who receive treatment one and those who receive treatment zero, look like they came from, the, look like now they have the same distribution, weighted distribution, then we're going to be in business. So we're going to search for those weights, W, that have that property. So to do that, we need to introduce one new concept, which is known as the propensity score. The propensity score is given to you by the probability that t equals one given x. Here again, we're going to use machine learning. Whereas in covariate adjustment, we use machine learning to predict y conditioned on x comma t. That's what covariate adjustment did. Here, we're going to be ignoring y altogether. We're just going to take x as input and we're going to be predicting t. So you can imagine using logistic regression, giving your covariates to predict which treatment any given data point came from. Here, you're using the full data set, of course, to make that prediction. So we're looking at both x's, both, you know, both uh, data points where t is equal one and t equals zero. T is your label for this. Then what we're going to do is given that learned propensity score, so we take, we take your data set, you first learn the propensity score, then we're going to reweight the data points according to the inverse of the propensity score. And you might ask, this looks familiar, right? This whole notion of reweighting data points, this whole notion of trying to figure out which quote unquote data set a data point came from, the data set of individuals who received treatment one or the data set of individuals who received treatment, treatment zero, that sounds really familiar. And it's because it's exactly what you saw in lecture 10 when we talked about data set shift. And in fact, this whole entire method, as you'll develop in problem set four, is a special case of uh, of, of learning under data set shift. So here now is the propensity score algorithm. We take our data set, which have samples of X, T, and Y, where y of, y, y of course tells you the potential outcome corresponding to the treatment T. We're going to use any machine learning method in order to estimate um, this, this uh, model that can give you a probability of treatment given X. Now, Critically, we need a probability for this. We're not trying to do classification. We need an actual probability. And so if you remember back to previous lectures where we spoke about, uh, about calibration, about the ability to accurately predict probabilities, that is going to be really important here. And so for example, if we were to use a deep, a deep neural network in order, to, in, order to predict, in order to estimate the propensity scores, deep neural networks are well known to not be calibrated, well calibrated. And so one would have to use one of a number of, of new methods that have been recently developed to make the output of deep learning calibrated in order to use this type of technique. So after finishing step one, now that you have a model that can allow you to estimate the propensity score for every data point X, we now can take those, take and estimate your average treatment effect with the following formula. It's one over N, of the sum over the data points where the data points corresponding to the treatment one of yi, that part is identical to before. But what you see now is that we're going to divide it by the propensity score. And so this denominator, that's the new piece here. That's the inverse of the propensity score is precisely the weighting that we were referring to earlier. And the same thing happens over here for ti equals zero. Now let's try to get some intuition about this formula. Um, and 
I like trying to get intuition by looking at a special case. So the simple special case that we might be familiar with is that of a randomized controlled trial where because you're flipping a coin and each data point either gets treatment zero or treatment one, then the propensity score is precisely deterministically equal to 0.5. So let's take this now, no machine learning done here. Let's just plug it in to see if we get back the formula that I showed you earlier for the estimate of the average treatment effect in a randomized control trial. So we plug that in over there. This is now, this now becomes 0.5 and plug that in over here. This also becomes 0.5. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to take that 0.5, we're going to uh, bring that out, and this is going to become a two over here and same a two over here. Um, and you get to the following formula, which is if you were to compare to the formula from a few slides ago, it's almost identical, except that a few slides ago over here, I had one over N1, and over here I had one over N0. Now, these two are two different estimators for the same thing. And the reason why you can see they're the same thing is that um, in a randomized control trial, the number of individuals that receive treatment one is on average N over two. Similarly, uh, the number of individuals that receive treatment zero are on average N over two. So, um, if you were to, um, that n over 2 sort of cancel, cancels out with this 2 over n is what gets you um, a correct estimator. So this is a slightly different estimator, but nearly identical to the, um, to the one that I showed you earlier. And, uh, and, and by this argument uh, is a consistent estimator of the average treatment effect in a randomized control trial. So any, any questions before I uh, try to drive this formula for you? Okay, so um, one student asks, uh, so the propensity score is the quote unquote bias of how likely people are assigned to y equal to uh, t equals one or t equals zero? Yes, that's exactly right. So if you were to imagine um, uh, taking an individual where um, this probability for that individual is let's say very close to one, it means that there are very few other people in the data set who receive treatment one. They're sort of, it, they're a uh, red data point in a sea of, uh, of blue data points. And by dividing by that, we're going to be trying to remove that bias. And that's exactly right. Um, thank you for that question. Are there other questions? Okay, um, I really appreciate the questions via, um, via the chat window, so thank you. All right, so let's, let's now uh, try to derive this formula. Recall the definition of average treatment effect. Um, and for those who are paying very close attention, you might notice that I removed the expectation over Y1. Uh, and for this derivation that I'm going to give you, I'm going to suppose, I'm going to assume that the potential outcomes are all deterministic because it makes the math easier, um, but is without loss of generality. So the average treatment effect is the expectation with respect to all individuals of the potential outcome Y1 minus the expectation with respect to all individuals of the potential outcome Y0. So this term over here is going to be our estimate of that. And this term over here is going to be our estimate of this expectation. So naively, if you were to just take the observed data, it would allow you to compute, you, if you, for example, just average the values of, of Y for the individuals who received treatment one, that would give you this expectation that I'm showing on the bottom here. I want you to compare that to the one that's actually needed in the average treatment effect. Whereas over here, it's an expectation with respect to individuals that receive treatment one, up here, this was an expectation with respect to indiv all individuals. But the thing inside the expectation is exactly identical. And that's the key point that we're going to work with, which is that we want an expectation with respect to a different distribution than the one that we actually have. And again, this should be ring bells because this sounds very, very familiar to the data set shift story that we talked about a few lectures ago. Um, 
So um, I'm going to uh, show you how to derive an estimator for just this first term, and the second term is obviously going to be identical. So let's start out with the following. Uh, we know that p of x given t times p of t is equal to p of x times p of t given x. So what I've just done here is use two different formulas for, um, for the rule of, um, for, for a joint distribution. And then I've divided by p of t given x in order to get the formula that I showed you a second ago. Um, I'm not going to attempt to erase it. I'll leave it up there. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, um, if we were to compute an expectation with respect to uh, p of x given t equals one, and if we were to now take the value that we observe, y1, which we can, which we can get observations for, for all the individuals who receive treatment one, and if we were to reweight this observation by this ratio, where remember this ratio um, uh, it, it showed up in the, in, in the previous bullet point, then um, what I'm going to show you in just a moment is that this is equal to the quantity that we actually wanted. Um, well, why is that? Well, if you, um, if you expand this expectation, this expectation is an integral with respect to P of X conditioned on T equals one. times the thing inside the brackets. And because we know that P of, because we know from up here that P of X condition on T equals one times P of T equals one divided by P of T equals one condition on X is equal to P of X. This whole thing is going to be equal to an integral times of P of X times, uh, times Y one, which is precisely the definition of the expectation that we want. So this was a very simple derivation to show you that the reweighting gets you what you need. Now we can estimate this expectation empirically as follows. The estimate, the, we're going to now sum over all data points that receive treatment one. We're going to take an average. So we're dividing by the number of data points that receive treatment one. For P of T equals one, we're just going to use the empirical estimate of how many individuals receive treatment one in the data set divided by the total number of individuals in the data set. That's P N one divided by N. And for the denominator, P of t equals one condition on x, we just plug in now the propensity score, which we had previously estimated. And we're done. And so that now is our estimate for the first term in the average treatment effect. And you could do that analogously for t equals zero. And I've shown you the full proof of why this is an unbiased estimator for, um, um, for average treatment effect. So um, I'm going to be concluding now in the next two minutes. Um, first, I just wanted to comment on what we just saw. So we saw a different way to estimate the average treatment effect, which only required estimating the propensity score. In particular, we never had to use a model to predict why in this approach for estimating the average treatment effect. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's a good thing because uh, if you had uh, errors in estimating your model Y, uh, as I showed you in the very beginning of today's lecture, that could have a very big impact on your estimate of your average treatment effect. And so that doesn't show up here. On the other hand, this has its own disadvantages. So for example, the propensity score is going to be really, uh, really affected by lack of overlap. Um, because when you have lack of overlap, it means there's some data points where the propensity score is very close to zero or very close to one. And then that really leads to very large variance in your estimators. Um, and a very common trick which is used to try to address that concern is known as clipping, where you simply clip the propensity scores so that they're always bounded away from zero and one. But that's really just a heuristic. Uh, and it can, of course, then lead to biased estimates of the average human effect. So there's a whole family of, of, of causal inference algorithms that attempt to use ideas from both covariate adjustment and inverse propensity weighting. Um, for example, there's a method called doubly robust estimators, and we'll try to provide a citation for, uh, for those estimators in the scribe notes. And these doubly robust estimators are a different family of estimators that actually bring in both of these techniques together. And they have a really nice property, which is that if either one of them fail, you still get valid estimates of average treatment effect. 
I'm going to skip um, this and just jump to the summary now, which is that we have presented two different approaches for work calls or inference from observational data, covariate adjustment and propensity score based methods. And both of these, I need to stress, are only going to give you valid results under the assumptions we outlined in the previous lecture. For example, that your causal graph is correct, critically, that there's no unobserved confounding. And second, that you have overlap um, between your two treatment classes. And third, if you're using a, um, um, if you're using a non-parametric regression approach, overlap is extremely important because without overlap, your model is undefined in regions of space. And thus, as a result, um, you have no way of verifying if your uh, extrapolations are correct. And so one has to use trust in the model, in, in the model which is not something we really like. Um, and in propensity score methods, overlap uh, uh, is very important because if you don't have that, you get uh, inverse propensity scores that are either um, uh, which are infinite um, and, uh, and lead to extremely high variance estimators. Um, so uh, in the end of the slides, which, will be which are already posted online, I include some references that I strongly encourage folks to follow up on. Um, first, references to two recent workshops that have been held in the machine learning community. Uh, so that you can get a sense of what the latest and greatest uh, uh, in terms of research and causal inference are. Um, a book, two different books on causal inference that you can download for free from MIT. And finally, some papers that I think are really interesting, particularly of interest potentially to course projects. Um, so we are at time now. Um, I will hang around for a few minutes after lecture as I would uh, normally, um, but I'm going to stop the recording uh, of the lecture.